Okay, year 12, analysis of inorganic compounds. So he, here's our inquiry question. How are the ions present in the environment identified and measured? So qualification, quantification. Okay, first syllabus point. Uh, we need to, well, we need to analyze the need for monitoring of the environment. Okay, it's a very, very broad topic. And we could get a multiple, multitude of different questions. So I've just prepared some stuff um, to give you some ammo for those long written questions. Okay, um, so let's see what I've written here. Humans have altered their surrounding environments for many thousands of years. Yeah, we've done stuff that's changed our environment. Um, as our population has increased and we've been manufacturing... So since the Industrial Revolution, uh, with that impact on the environment has increased. Okay, um, so having knowledge of these negative impacts um, have been seen by some astute scientists from the beginning. Um, so the Industrial Revolution, some scientists kind of went, hang on, if we do this, maybe this will happen. But really, the environmental movement started in the 1960s. Okay, um, I love that image. Google images, analysis of water. They're collecting water in like a, um, it looks like a cereal container where he has that suit. What is in that water? Okay. So we've realized in recent years, um, and we're still continuing to realize that functioning ecosystems hold value in many different ways. Okay. Uh, most of the human population will be held up on economic value in renewable resources. Um, and we also hold value in providing basic needs, including fresh water and oxygen, which is hugely important, and the aesthetic value. Okay, don't discount that. Okay, so talking about pollutants. Okay, so it can be used to describe any substance introduced the into the environment that has an undesirable effect. So it's very, very broad, okay? You can release too much oxygen into the environment and have a detrimental effect. Um, it's very broad. Um, oh, look, this is a very broad definition. It covers the obvious human-introduced substances that can kill wildlife through to natural emissions from volcanoes, Okay. So you've got human pollution and you've also got natural pollution from volcanoes. So pollution is a term that not many chemists use. We don't usually use because of pollution and stuff like that. We tend to go in for specifics, for spe specific chemical compounds and their impacts and their chemistry, okay? So hopefully that's what you can do. Okay, I put this together. Let's see how well I did. I put it in bold too. The need to monitor the environment is due to the disconnect between our actions and our values, okay? We're placing value in the natural environment, and we're saying it's important, and we've known that for a long time, and to a large degree chemically for a short amount of time, but a decent amount of time. But what our actions are doing is going against those values, okay? So if we are to preserve or, I like this, manufacture ecosystems, um, we have to monitor our chemical impact on them in order to maintain them. So we want to maintain our ecosystems, have functioning ecosystems. Um, we want to preserve the ones that are still going, that we think are natural. Um, and we also want to ideally create more or recreate stuff maybe not was originally there, but an, an ecosystem. So that's why I chose the term manufacturing. Okay, so to help this out, governments have put in place guidelines for air, water, and soil quality in the aim for benefit to benefit and promote healthy environments. So governments have come in with guidelines and laws saying you can do this, but you cannot do this. Okay, um, how rigorous they are is open to a huge amount of debate, and how how accurate and how good they are is open to a huge amount of amount of debate. Okay, so I put a couple of images in here, like of a fish kill. Um, could have been a multitude of things. 
a nice image here, I'm guessing, from China of an air pollution. And this lovely lady up the top in a book, uh, which was written in the, I think, the late 50s, uh, Rachel Carson. It's all about her observations of a spring, uh, which is a natural water source. And it's changing uh, with contact with um, pesticides and stuff like that so that was I think late 50s and it helped spurn the 1960s going on environmental movement I think that video might be about her if you want to learn some more okay so let's talk a bit about atmospheric pollutants I've got uh, this nice chemical chemical interest compound interest diagram here um, so it's just giving you a broad idea of different compounds and their impact on the atmosphere. Uh, we kind of know some, and I'd stick to those for kind of uh, ammunition for your questions. So carbon monoxide we've talked about with equilibrium. Um, it's toxic to uh, living things that use hemoglobin. Um, and so it affects human health and reduces oxygen carrying capacity in hemoglobin carrying blood might be other type of blood too um, but at least hemoglobin um, it also reacts with other atmospheric gases to produce ozone uh, we'll talk about ozone in a second but we don't want ozone down on our level the troposphere down here we want it up there in the stratosphere absor absorbing uv okay so carbon monoxide we talked about carbon dioxide we're very familiar with especially when we talk about the impact of hydrocarbons and stuff so it's good ammunition to talk about in an exam like this we monitor carbon dioxide because it, we know it's one of the major greenhouse gases that we're emitting and is absorbing heat and trapping heat here on earth so we've always got constant monitoring systems to see that um, to see what our impact is and hopefully monitor um, our slowing down of our emission of carbon dioxide to to kind of leveling off and hopefully going backwards when we draw carbon dioxide back down but um, yeah huge impacts um, nitrogen oxides we haven't really talked about but they get formed around combustion engines. Okay, so combustion in road and transport. Nitrous oxide is an important global warming contributor. Okay, so one of those ones that absorbs in the infrared and traps, traps heat. Nitrogen dioxide is involved with ozone and ozone down here. Okay, so you're getting smog problems and stuff like that, that complex chemistry. Um, do we have ozone here? Maybe I should talk about it. Oh, here's ozone down here. Okay, so that where we want ozone is in the stratosphere, and that's how it's naturally formed over time, where it absorbs UV rays coming in from the sun. So it stops that damaging UV rays getting right down here to the surface. But ozone down here on the surface can be very harmful and does some weird chemistry with nitrous oxides and carbon monoxide stuff to produce smog and low air quality and it's an irritant in the lungs. Okay, so um, ozone down here at the troposphere, our level is a problem. Ozone up in the stratosphere, double thumbs up, does a great job. Okay. Um, there's stuff like sulfur dioxide here too. Coming, it comes from human-made burning fossil fuels, especially um, coal. Okay, it contributes to smog, and it also reacts with water. It dissolves in water to produce sulfuric acid. So it's the cause of acid rain. Um, very rare here in the southern hemisphere, but a large problem in the northern hemisphere. Um, hopefully becoming a bit less, okay? Um, so the impact of sulfur dioxide or acid rain is that it ends up, uh, so the pH of the rain is less, it damages leaves on plants and stuff like that, so they uh, um, have developmental and growth problems or just die off. Okay, um, talked about ozone. The only other thing that I go in, I won't talk much about ammonia, VOCs, not too much, PDPs, oh sorry, POPs, uh, um, particulate matter is quite important. 
Okay, this is the easiest way to connect this is remember when we're talking about incomplete combustion we said soot or carbon solid. That's one of the main particulate matters that we have problems with, okay? So very small particles um, and solid particles generated from um, the com incomplete combustion of fuels um, and put into the atmosphere. And you can usually see it around diesel trucks and stuff like that. Um, that causes low air quality, so you can't see very much. It looks terrible. It's It eventually settles onto surfaces and blocks leaves and stuff like that, and it's um, breathing it in is a large problem. Huge irritant to lungs as well. I think I'll leave it there for atmospheric pollutants. Okay, another issue we have is uh, storing and transportation of um, certain chemicals that we produce, okay? Uh, usually if it's done well, it's all fine, but when there's a spill, there's a big problem, okay? So I've written a chemical spill can be thought of as being accidental. So you can have accidental chemical spills such as explosions, a fire, a crack in a storage tank, or um, a crashed transport vehicle. Um, however, you've also got purposeful and purposeful release okay of chemicals so knowingly or unknowingly of certain hazardous chemicals have the same result so there are very corrupt people out there who just care about money and so to get rid of their waste they'll just release it knowingly how bad it is okay i know how bad this is i don't care i'm going to release it because i want to get rid of this waste because it costs too much and blah, blah 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 okay unknowingly as well okay so you've got historical cases where chemicals were released into the environment years ago without much knowledge and which, without much thought, forethought, which was completely legal at the time. But now we're seeing that, hey, look at this ecosystem and the damage and the water quality is very toxic and problems now with our greater understanding. So unknowingly as well. That's why I put that term there. Okay, ongoing monitoring of the waterways and soil around spills, determine the extent of the damage, how we can remediate, what, remediate it, what treatment we should be put in place, and also afterwards, once we do do treatment, how effective is that, is that treatment, okay? If, it's, if we go back with a strategy and go, oh, we're gonna treat it and we're gonna do this, but we go back and test it and it's not reducing the levels of harmful stuff in there, that treatment's not effective and we've got to revise it, okay? So, extent of the damage, what treatment, and the effectiveness of the treatment. I've kind of kept it in chronological order for problem fixing. So we've just got a general spill here. Someone's probably putting um, sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate on there. Here is an image from a old film of uh, this hose is spraying out a chemical shortened name is DDT you probably heard it's a bad thing these days back at the time everyone's like oh this is really safe this is a very safe pesticide it's so safe that we're going to spray it on all these children swimming in the pool uh, was it safe no uh, very very tragic and here I've just got a tanker um, and what looks like it's had a spill and someone's put either that's the spill the white there or someone's put some white on to treat the spill all right, another source of monitoring in the environment and why it's needed is a common problem that we may have touched on a little bit before is um, the leaching of nutrients from artificial fertilizers into the environment, okay? So artificial uh, fertilizers contain nitrates and phosphates usually. That's what we want to get back in our soil. That's what plants take out of our soil, okay? We can do that in the long term by planting certain crops, but we want to do it quickly so we use fertilizer, okay? Okay, so a farmer, let's say, puts it on their land, spreads it all out, okay? Puts too much on. It leads to when it rains, it being dissolved and taken away from the site, or it leaches into the ground and mixes with the groundwater, which can transmit uh, transmit or move throughout the location. 
So you're getting that fertilizer being dissolved and transported through different ways. Okay. These nitrates and phosphates are nutrients for living things. So they do good for the soil. They do good for the soil and the plants growing in it. Get into a waterway, and what's growing in there is algae, and they love these nutrients too, and they grow as well, and they love it. And what ends up happening is you get increased growth of algae and other plants underneath, but the algae sits on the surface, and you get what's called an algal bloom, or which is just this algae's got a lot of nutrients, so it grows out. Um, it grows out of control. Okay, what ends up happening is it blocks light from coming in and the plants underneath it start to die and they take up the oxygen when they're dying and so the dissolved oxygen decreases as well. The dissolved oxygen in, the, in that waterway. So fish and other living things that rely on the dissolved oxygen start to die as well. So you get decomposition mixing in here as well. Okay, organisms die the plants die, the fish die, the algae on top still does good, but as as it dies and grows, the, the algae can sometimes release other toxins into the water as well. So this is what happens with an algal bloom. Okay, so monitoring waterways for nitrate and phosphate levels will indicate fertilizer runoff and help to prevent this process of algal blooms, or another fancy word for it is here, eutrophication. Okay. Another way that we have to monitor our environment is from mines and mining. Okay, so one of the most common ways of uh, things to get into the environment through mining is acid mine drainage. Okay, so what happens is water that comes from rain and stuff comes through the rocks and comes into the mine and reacts with certain, certain um, minerals in there to turn the water acidic, okay? The mineral is pyrite, you don't need to remember it, but what ends up happening is this chemical here, you get this mineral called pyrite or iron sulfide with water and oxygen going to iron, sulfate and H+. So you're getting um, sulfuric acid forming, okay? And this sulfuric acid will be transported with the water coming out. Okay, so it goes into the waterways and you get dead aquatic life because the pH is too low. Okay, let's look at this diagram that I found. So during mining, pyrite is exposed to oxygen, get groundwater seeps into the mine. The oxygen, the water and the pyrite react to form sulfuric acid and dissolve the metals into rocks. Um, what did I put under here? The water drains out of the mine and the dissolved metals react with oxygen and fall out of solution into the stream. So this orange color, you get the rusty color, and the aquatic animals and plants are killed by the drainage and the acid, okay? Um, yeah, definite problem there. You also get heavy metals leaching out as well, but I like that acid mine one. That's a good example. So we need to monitor the water that's coming out from mines especially its pH, to prevent this from happening, okay? So acid water runoff from mines, a long-term problem. It can take around two years after a mine starts operating to detect changes in the waterways, okay? So it's long, and the problem can still persist after the mines close. So cases of this runoff still occur in mines that have ceased operations for up to 40 years. So effects of acid mine runoff include the Death and developmental damage to nearly all life in the waterways, including plant, animal, bacterial, contamination of drinking water, corrosion of infrastructure such as bridges, yeah, acid and metal, <laughs> and you've also got biomagnification of toxic metals. So you get this distinctive rusty coloured water, and you get biomagnification where the heavy metals go into the lower part of the... Um, food chain and it gets magnified as it goes up to the food chain okay and here's just another diagram to help you out okay so how it's dealt with how it should be dealt with is something like this 
the the mind that comes from sorry the mind that comes from the water the water that comes through the mind is blocked okay and directed okay it's directed into pools and stuff like that like up here draining channels and stuff um the the ph is increased okay so a base is added like sodium carbonate or something so that then those metals that were as an ion or were oxidized are now reduced and they come out as solid metals okay then the water is allowed to sit for long periods of time so the solid metals settle to the bottom of these pools so here's like some settling pools settling down here okay and then the clean water is decanted from the top of the pool and that mud down the bottom that is metal rich can be disposed of or used for mining purposes like you can get other metals out of it okay all right so hopefully that gives you some fodder for some big type of questions so that section it's a bit of a gamble it's always going to be at least five marks could be six marks could be seven marks could be eight marks but you need some examples there and i've given you a worksheet to work through okay thanks for listening